This is the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we teach you the proven methods to grow your seven-figure business to 10 million and beyond. Please welcome your host, Brett Gilliland. Welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm excited to have our guest today and to introduce him. His name is David Wax. David is a serial entrepreneur, so I don't want to limit him to his current role as founder and CEO of Handwritten. We'll talk more about Handwritten here in a little bit, but before we get into what he's doing now, let's go back a little bit. Uh, David also founded a company called Sell It, which was a mobile marketing platform and mobile agency. Under David's leadership, Sell It became a leading player in the mobile marketing space and invented the concept of mobile customer relationship management which is uh-huh. quite, quite a cool thing. Um, Sell It developed one of the most robust and widely used mobile marketing platforms in the world, delivering millions of SMS and MMS messages to consumers daily. Yep. David exited Sell It. Uh, he sold it. <laughs> he sold Sell It to Hello World in January of 2012. Went on to stay there with the company for a couple of years, which we'll probably get into in our visit. Uh, without further ado, let me welcome you, David. Thank you for coming to the show today. Thank you, Brett, for having me. It's a, it's an honor to to be on your show. Yeah, and I'm, I'm excited about what you've done in the past, and and I'm also geeking out about what you're doing now with handwritten, because unlike many of our guests, uh, you and I actually live and work in the Greater Phoenix area, so I could come to your to your. I, I don't even know what you call it, a, a, your location. Yeah, call it a shop. office, whatever. Yeah, your office, your shop, your location, and see handwritten in action. So I'd love for you to tell everybody, give a little context about what handwritten is, what you're doing there, uh, because I think it is super fascinating. Yeah, so um, at my, in my prior life at Sell It, I was, we were doing all this text messaging stuff, and then I had a successful exit from that. And I was thinking, geez, I, and I was stuck with sell it for two years. And I was thinking, you know, what can I do next? Cause I'm certainly too young to retire. I'll never retire. If I retire, that'd be a huge mistake. Um, but um, so I was thinking, what, what could I do next? And I realized a, I was part of the problem because, you know, everybody was getting a thousand text messages a month and 134 emails and Slack and teams and Twitter and all these other forms forms of communication, maybe not Teams, but but the rest of it. Uh, teams wasn't around yet, um, and I realized people are overwhelmed with the noise of digital communication. But at the same time, when I walked around the offices of my employees, if they had received a handwritten note from somebody, it was on display on their bookshelf, or it was on their desk, or maybe they brought it home and stuck it to their refrigerator. And I thought there must be a way to scale handwritten outreach. And that's where handwritten came from. From my own thought, gee, this would be a cool service where I could type in a note, have it handwritten, include a gift card to Starbucks or something, and then have it mailed um, in the next business day. And that's that's kind of what we do. So if you, um, like the screen behind me, you can see the robots there. We have 175 in our facility here. We now lease some both domestically and internationally as well. Um, And we do... 20,000 notes on a, on a, on a busy day around here. So um, it's a, it's interesting in that it's fully integrated. So, or fully vertically integrated. So we start with plastic sheets and electronic components. And we turn that into robots and then we take blank paper and we have a digital press that prints it into cardstock. We feed that cardstock into the robots to write it out. Um, So it's, it's interesting. And it, uh, it scratches all my geeky itches as far as programming and building robots. And it's funny, I'm starting a side project now with my kids, building a robot for them and maybe starting a YouTube show about it. So yeah, there's um, it's a fun business and it seems to be pretty much universally applicable. Like if somebody says, who are your clients? It's like anybody that wants to communicate with a customer because I feel like most people are fatigued by electronic communication, receiving it, and they understand that their recipients are fatigued by it as well. And it will either not get read 
it will get read and discounted, meaning you could send the most personal thing to somebody, but they'll think it was written by ChatGPT or something like that, um, versus a handwritten note they feel is unscalable. And the investment of time that people spend writing handwritten notes is really what makes people's eyebrows raise. You know, um, by forcing yourself to turn off your computer, step away from your phone, whatever, to write a handwritten note, that's the valuable part, not the $5 Starbucks gift card inside. Yeah, so. well, I'm going to jump on the the fact, I mean, you you said it was interesting, uh, the geeky side of you loves yeah. what you're doing there. I'll, I'll say the geeky side of me loved touring your facility. It was it was really cool to see the robots in action and and super impressive to see how human-like the outcome, right? The, the handwritten cards that I got to see were incredible. So hats off to you and the team for making something something like that work. And, you know, I wish everybody could come and see it in action. Uh, since they can't, they can just live through my eyes a little bit. <laughs> it was impressive to see. Uh, but let's let's focus in on the lessons that you learned both as you grew, sell it, and, and exited, and then yep. stayed on there for a couple of years, and then you starting up in this business and scaling it to the point that you have. There's lots of good entrepreneurial journey, leadership lessons in there. Yeah. And we want to we wanna mine a few of those with the time that we have together. So um, let's talk about what it was like to go from the boss at Sell It to mm -hmm. now being in an acquired company yeah. and presumably having somebody now that you report to and what that's like in that transition and anything you may have learned in that process. Yeah, you know, um, when I started Sell It, it was a one-guy shop. It was me in the corner of a bedroom programming uh, with a two-liter bottle of Diet Mountain Dew next to me, like classic startup, you know, thing for a solid year and a half to two years. And then I moved back to Chicago and slowly over the next four to six years, built up a team. Um, and by the end of it, we had about 25 people. So it, it was something. And um, the, the greatest gift of that experience was kind of uh, training and uh, building leaders so for instance, um, I was just on a phone call this morning with a client of ours now. Their CTO used to be one of my programmers. And when he started at Sell It, he was a very shy, quiet guy. And we turned him into a leader. And there was another two people on the account management side um, that we were, you know, I was very proud to see what they went off and did because they were both, they kind of turned from, you know, little, little yeah, unexperienced women straight out of school to very capable, very eloquent um, leaders in account management in this industry. So that was really cool. But I didn't have any perspective on it because when you run a company for eight years or whatever it was, you kind of forget how other people do it. And I realized when I joined Hello World, which is the company that acquired us, that um, it was probably a little too hands on. And I saw how Matt Wise, the CEO of Hello World, handled things. Now, I think there's extremes on both sides. You don't want to be completely hands off either, but you want to give enough space. You know, your role as a CEO and a leader is not to provide the answers. It's to coach your team and direct your team so they can find the answers. And I follow my fall into the trap of trying to find all the answers myself too much of the time, as opposed to engaging the team to come up with their solutions. So, and I'm still guilty of that. Well, at least yeah. I'm aware of it. I was going to say, uh, you're, you're not here because you're perfect at it. Yeah. You're here because you have some insights and some experience to share. So let's talk about the times that you have found success. Uh, and maybe even before we get to the success, let's talk about things you have done to practice getting better at that? Because I, I want people to go from where they are now to, you know, the, the very capable and confident CEO, team builder, leader, developer, but it's, it's not one step. There's lots of stuff that Correct. goes into becoming that. So what has helped you when you've done that well? What has helped you to do it right? Quite frankly, one of the biggest things that did it for me at Sell It. And to a lesser degree now, because I've gotten too hands-on again, 
but um, was about right before we sold, well, not right before, a year before we sold Sell It. I was living in Chicago for several years. I was sick of the rain and the cold and everything. And I picked up and I moved to Marina Del Rey, California, pretty much unbeknownst to my team. Wow. And I let them all know I'd be working part-time in California and creating that physical separation created the mental separation of the team to where they felt more autonomous. And I'm not saying always, you know, pick up and go somewhere else to another state, but maybe as a leader, you should do one or two work from home days or something like that to create that separation where the team has to figure out their own answers. And sometimes it's just too easy to run into your office with every single question. And if you're not as available, it kind of forces them to be a little bit more um, autonomous. Also kind of there's, uh, and I can't remember the book. I, I'd, I'd lie if I said I read the book. I, I listened to the Blinkist on the book of coaching and which is like a crib notes on the book, on this coaching book. But they said you should really walk into your team's offices and say, and, you know, just have some open-ended questions like what's on your mind today? Uh, is there anything else on your mind? Kind of these very uh, open questions to get them thinking about the challenges they're facing in the workplace and then try to see if you can help them develop strategies on their own, you know, say, what do you think the answer for that is? Or what would you do next here? And really, you know, try to call the answer out of them. So I've been doing that a lot more than I used to do. I'll give you a, a parable. Um, you know, I'm still a little bit in the weeds on some programming of the robots. I've given up pretty much everything else, but but uh, much like Michael Gerber says in E-Myth, you shouldn't be the pie baker. You should be managing pie bakers and determining, you know, where you're going to expand to bake more pies or whatever. Uh, but I still like baking the pies of some of this programming, which I do and I shouldn't. And I'm turning that over finally right now. But I was on vacation in uh, Puerto Vallarta a few weeks ago, and I brought a little programming down to do um, on the side. And it wasn't a big deal, but um, I was doing that. And our friends flew down to Puerto Vallarta. But the difference between us and them, we flew down on American Airlines, and they flew down in a private jet. And the reason they flew down in a private jet is their C he's a CEO too, but he's much more hands-off. And I believe it's that hands-off. I mean, he's hands-on, but he's hands-off. I think he's better at empowering his team to do stuff. So he's not the single point of failure and the bottleneck. And uh, whether he knows it or not, I'm trying to learn a lot from him as far as um, don't be that single point of failure. Don't be that bottleneck. And because of that, he's flying around in private jets and I'm flying coach. So, um, you know. It's a great parable. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Parables by David. Parable um, by David. I, I think that you're, you're onto something really big. And I love the practical suggestions you, you gave. So I think my, my role, any value I bring to this podcast is asking good questions and then summarizing good stuff that I heard. So what I, what I heard you say is, if we want to build something really meaningfully meaningful as in scaled in scale or in impact, then we have to figure out how to get out of the day to day. So it can grow beyond what, what our two arms can keep around, right? right. Yeah. It's got to, and, and, and I heard two really good practical things that you would suggest or you've learned. One is some physical separation so that they're less, you're less accessible to the team. They have to think through it more. Mm -hmm. And the other one was getting good at asking thoughtful questions that invite them to engage in a new way. So they're not just coming to you for answers. You're asking them questions about how they think, what solutions they've found, what's on their mind, right? Like all of those good mm -hmm. questions that you, uh, you sort of modeled. So I love all of that. Um, tell me a little bit, of, uh, unless you have something else on that topic, anything else on that one, David? No, that's really it. I, I'm not going to lie. I'm not the best manager in the world. I think if there's an area I could really grow in, it would be that. I think I'm hot-headed and uh, a know-it-all. And I, I think I got to get, you know, which I think a lot of entrepreneurs are. Um, so, but those are, you know, as I'm, but I'm also very introspective. And I think, um, you know, as I'm aging and um, 
trying to define myself, reinvent myself. Those are the leadership and becoming a less reactive leader is really first and foremost, you know, something I'm working on. Well, for somebody who thinks he's hot headed and has all the answers, it takes a lot of uh, humility and self-awareness to describe some of what you just described. Um, and again, this isn't about perfection. This is about a journey and, and you're squarely in that path and you have some great experience to share. So let's get back to some of that experience. Um, you have a, a column that in, yeah. in Inc. Magazine, right? Correct, yeah. Or Inc. Online. I don't know what you even call it anymore. Yeah. yeah. But it's called, uh, is it stepping out of the day-to-day? -day? Stepping away from the day-to-day, -day, yeah. Stepping away, thank you. Stepping away from the day-to-day me relying too much on a poor memory there, stepping away from the day-to-day. -day. So we've talked about that a little bit already. Are there, are there other tips or ideas that you have to share about how to step away from the day-to-day? -day? I think being very cognizant of the distractions in life. Um, one of the biggest life hacks I've done recently is turning off all the little circle notifications on apps on my phone. Mm. You know, uh, all those ones and 10,000s that appear on every stupid app. Um, you know, yeah, I still have the one for my email, but it's a it's a meaningless number having 5,000 unread emails there, you know. Um, but the rest of them, I've really tried to turn off because all that stuff just gives me anxiety. Um, I also try to, on a daily basis, block out time to get work done and to focus and not get interrupted. So every day my calendar is blocked out um, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. because I just need time to collect my thoughts in the morning. And like most people, I've got my Calendly link and everything else. And if I don't block out time for myself, you know, my Calendly is gonna be totally booked and nobody stops to think, geez, they've got no availability on Tuesday except this 15 minutes. So I'm gonna take that, you know? Um, so I really, I really try to, you know, put in placeholders that allow me to breathe and eat lunch and, and turn it all off kind of blocking out time, quiet time, I think is, is certainly important. And then, you know, outside of stepping away, I try to do stuff like meditate. Um, I actually had an article written about me for Inc. Magazine also, but the actual print pub about my experience with, um, hypnotism and ways that can improve my leadership, specifically being reactive. I, I had, I've used hypnotism in other parts of my life. So I tried to bring it into my business life. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, teach their own, but those are kind of the, the techniques I use. Yeah. Well, whatever the actual technique, let's talk about the principles that you just outlined. I, I see principles when people share their examples. And, and one of them is just getting focus time. Well, the first one you shared was eliminate more of the, the noise, eliminate more distractors yep. with a little life hack of, of those little notification bubbles and numbers. I, I love that you brought that up. Simple things that can just give our brains a break and let us focus on some other things that are, are more important. So shutting off some of the noise, the external signals is great. And then that, that principle of you know, just making time for focus, for thinking, and whether it's, whether you're, and, and I like both sides, the business side where you have in your calendar, there's a block of time that's just for you to focus on that day. Uh, you didn't share if the meditation happens outside of that, but on the personal side, how do we make sure we're centered, we're clear, and we've got the noise out, and we know exactly what we want to do it who we want to be a lot a lot of intentionality in that time so you've built in focus time ways to be intentional and if it if there's so many ways and and helps with meditation now you know depending on on your personal religious beliefs and practices there's good meditative morning routine end of day kind of stuff that people do with journaling um I'm, I love that you've tried some hypnotism and uh, uh, just whatever you can do to get clear, to cut out the noise. Uh, very, very practical and great tips. So thank you for sharing those. I would love for you to, uh, you said you were up to about 25 team members at Sell It. 
Yeah. And, and we need to do some spelling here for our listeners because not everybody's going to look at it. So sell like cell phone, right? Sell it, which is now uh, that was acquired and uh, now handwritten because I want them to look into this handwritten is with a Y, not an I in the letter in the word written, right? So all together handwritten with a Y. If you're going to be looking for that, it'll be in our show notes, but I want, I want you all to hear that. So about 25 then. I know at one point we spoke recently, you were in the 35, 40 range or something like that of, of team members. You've grown handwritten larger in number of people. And I know that, that that leadership lesson begins to become really important as the numbers grow. So talk to us for a minute about the importance of being able to build that next level of leadership to be able to take on more people. Yeah. So we have about 40 people now, and I've always prided myself on a flat organization. But when new employees come into your office asking how which direction to stuff an envelope, if you want the front of the card in the front of the envelope or the front of the card in the back, I got bigger fish to fry and there needs to be somebody in between us. So having a strong middle layer, I'm not saying multi multi layers all the way up, but having at least one layer separating you from the masses. And I've been fortunate and it's taken many revisions, but been fortunate to build a strong leadership team. And then like many people, um, we institute EOS um, to keep our management team on track. And I believe many of the managers then use EOS down the down the path to 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 manage their team meetings and 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 um, all of that. But um, you know, having that many people report to one person is just it's just impossible. And at the same time of doing that, I do believe in a little bit of what I call management by walking around, which is just, you know, every morning I'll walk around and say good morning to everybody and um, you know, chit chat a little bit just so everybody feels heard. But but yeah, I mean, now I'm very proud that I have very few people directly under me. I mean, I've got five people or so, which is very manageable. So um, that's been that's been a good lesson. And, and you know, also hiring up a bit. Um, so we just hired a new director of um, program, you know, the soft, software development. And it's so nice to have somebody in place where I no longer have to write programs on my Puerto Vallarta vacation. Um, pretty much across the board, we've really upgraded our staff. <clears throat> At first, when when I was hiring, I was hiring a bunch of kids, excited kids straight out of college. Now I see the very big benefit of having some experience. And then also an even bigger benefit of m emotional maturity. Um, I don't even know at this point if it's emotional maturity or if it's just a generational thing, but um, the current generation coming out of school is very difficult to work with for me. So um, I like having a more seasoned workforce. I feel like they have a better work ethic um, and they don't have this, you know, every day at the job isn't a hundred percent life fulfilling, therefore I'm going to quit. Or, you know, I'm here today, but tomorrow I'll be somewhere else. Um, you know, this total lack of commitment. And I feel like when I bring people in and we invest in you, we, you know, it takes several months to get up to speed on pretty much any job. And then you quit just because you're not feeling it one day. It's just, it's really tough. So we've been investing a lot in better people, more mature people. We do a lot of testing when we bring people in now around their cultural fit, in addition to their technical fit. Um, you know, can they do the job? We also do just kind of, are they the right person? And kind of listening for cues as far as how long they've held their last jobs. Um, you know, we, we don't even interview anybody if they've changed jobs every seven months or anything like that. So those are kind of the things we've done um, because I find this environment, I mean, we had a lot, I'm not going to lie, we had a ton of turnover last year, um, a ton. We had 50% turnover last year, which is very detrimental to an organization. I mean, Painful. culturally, it's yeah. decimating. Yeah. Yeah. It's decimating culturally from a sales perspective. It, it, derails your sales because you have momentum, you know, uh, and yeah, you, you have your CRM system where you could pick up sales, but it's, you know, it doesn't work so great. So, um, you know, 
this year, I, I feel, and we just had our quarterly meeting about it. I feel like a lot of those concerns are gone now. I feel like we have a very, very strong team um, pretty much across the organization. So yeah, it's really about building, you know, and I'm not giving you a very um, succinct answer here and I apologize, but it's about building a middle layer and trusting that middle layer to grow their teams. And then also ensuring that when you hire people, you're not looking for overly cheap young talent. Um, you know, you're looking to make the right investments so that you have the appropriate level of uh, emotional maturity, if nothing else. Yeah. Well, let's, we, we could probably take the, the generational comments out of it and just focus on the emotional maturity. There's some younger people who have the emotional maturity you're talking about. Oh, a hundred percent. My, my, one of my favorite employees around here, I think is 28 years old and he acts like a 50 year old and yeah, he's incredible. Right? Like, it, it's he's not, a, he's it's a not leader. so much about the age, but, but life right. experience typically brings that emotional experience and, and that's why, or that emotional maturity. And that's why we often find it in maybe the, the, the previous generation. But anyway, I, I love your points. You, you can't possibly go to 40 people without having some other leadership team. And, mm -hmm. and, and you've learned that. Um, I like that you're doing some, just because you have five direct reports now doesn't mean that the other people are unimportant to you. And so you're getting around, you're, you're staying connected, the management by walking around. And uh, you're, you've learned a lot and shared some great tips about how to make sure that the people coming in to fill all those important seats are the, are the kind of people who are going to stay committed, be great team players, you know, all the things that just beyond being able to do a job, we want to know where their commitment is and yeah. they get along with everybody and be additive to the, to the culture and environment we're creating. So uh, love it. And, and I love that you have a system. This is the other thing that I wanted to just draw out as we wrap up. A system for keeping everybody organized and aligned, focused and aligned. And uh, you mentioned EOS. It's a popular system. We have our elite business growth method. There are other systems. Whatever, whatever system you use, let's have a way and a rhythm around that way that leaders stay connected. They coordinate well. They, they align resources. And as you grow, that's, that's just out of necessity that you got to have some way of organizing all the planning and execution for the long term and the short term. And um, I think the transition from being the business owner who has 10 or 12 direct reports to now you're leading 20, 30, 40 people and you got a, a management layer that requires that kind of structure and that kind of meeting rhythm for everybody to stay aligned. So 100%. Um, and, and to your point, when we rolled out our management system, I said, look, this management system is not perfect, but at least it's a system and we yeah. need something, even if it's not perfect, just to grab onto. Um, so it's been good from that perspective and uh, just improved communication and keeping everybody's eye on the ball, you know, uh, on a scorecard approach. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's very important to you know to make sure your management team feels engaged. I mean, they could feel like, what are they doing? You know, um, does the CEO know what they're up to and all this stuff? And I, I I really try to make sure that my team knows I'm I'm intimately involved. It may might not be acting on it, but I but I'm intimately aware of what's going on. Yeah. All right. Well, very good, David. If people want to learn more about handwritten, your your current business or they want to connect with you on social or check out your column on Inc. What, what is the best way for people to connect with you or learn more? I'd probably say just email me, david at handwritten.com, H-A-N-D-W-R-Y-T-T-N. Um, I am on Twitter, David B as in boy, Wax, which is, uh, you'll see in the show notes, it's W-A-C-H-S. Um, and then on LinkedIn, I'm, I'm not really a Facebooker or anything like that, but um but, you know, certainly feel free to email me. I'm, I'm always happy to answer questions. Or if you're interested in using handwritten, you can just um, visit our website, uh, either request free samples, which are always good, or sign up and use the code Dave sent me, D-A-V-E-S-E-N-T-M-E, -E -E, when you sign up and you'll get a couple bucks for a few, few cards on me. So uh, give that a shot if you can. That's awesome. Well, thank you, David, for being our guest and sharing so many great insights from your own entrepreneurial and leadership journey. And I uh, just appreciate you being here. Thank you, Brett. Thanks for, uh, for doing what you do. 
All right, everyone, please share, like, do all those things so that we can help as many seven-figure business owners as possible. Learn from lessons like the ones that were shared today by David. We love having you here with us and look forward to having you here next time. You've been listening to the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast with your host, Brett Gillerland. Be sure to leave a rating and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. You may also want to visit our website, EliteEntrepreneursPodcast.com, to find additional resources to grow your business from seven figures to 10 million and beyond. <laughs>